Welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Skeel and I am your host for Wisdom School TV. And I'd like you to welcome I'd like to welcome you to a very special interview today for Wisdom School TV. Today I will be interviewing Dr. Larry Dossey about his brand new book, One Mind, how our individual mind is part of a greater consciousness and why it matters. Now, the why it matters part is really important to me, but we'll, we'll get there in the interview. If this is your first time visiting the Wisdom School TV video library, I invite you to come back and listen to one of the many interviews and programs that are here. You will find topics that cover what I believe are paradigm-shifting conversations, important conversations about our world and about the greater reality of who you are and why it matters. All of the recorded Wisdom School TV programs are free to you. And now that you have the password, and vis please visit often and spread the word if you find value in these conversations. You know, that's one of the things that you can do to um, help bring forward this consciousness is tell your friends so they can sign up for Wisdom School TV as well. For I believe that with the sound of our compassionate collective voices, we are speaking this new world into reality. Today's interview will be one of those conversations, I am sure. Let me introduce you to Larry, Dr. Larry Dossey. I want to read the bio. This is his new book, by the way. Isn't it lovely? One Mind, How Our Individual Mind is Part of a Greater Consciousness and Why It Matters. I'll just read you the bio on the back flap of the book. His bio is, is, is extensive. Uh, if you are not familiar with uh, Dr. Dossey, um, I recommend that you visit his website, which is www.dossydossey.com. Uh, but let me just read you just a snippet so you get a sense of this, um, definitely this leading thought leader of our time. Larry Dossey, MD, is a leader in bringing scientific understanding to spirituality and rigorous proof to integrative medicine. He is an internal medicine physician and the former chief of staff of Medical City Dallas Hospital. Dr. Dossey is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Healing Words, and 11 other books that have been translated and published around the world. He has lectured at the nation's leading medical schools and hospitals and internationally. Well, I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Larry Dossey to Wisdom School TV. Welcome, Larry. Rebecca, it's just a great honor to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, it is my pleasure. And this is not the first time we've been able, I've been able to interview you. That's correct. I hope it isn't the last one. <laughs> well, me too. The last time I, I, we were on radio, it was Mastering the Shift, and we talked about The Power of Premonitions, your book. And now we get to talk about your brand new book, which um, I'm very excited to get into. So um, you and I are both here on the screen here, and um, I will be going in and out of the screen from time to time just to give you the um, sort of full attention here. Well, congratulations. How, well, thank you. How um, does, it, it's number 12, and I... You know, I uh, have a little trepidation because my wife says you're sneaking up on 13, and that has all sorts of uh, implications, so uh, uh, I'm glad we're going to dwell on number 12 here. Well, this book, Larry, is quite, quite a book. Um, wow. I mean, first of all, that you've published 12 books, and, and all of the wisdom and thought leader uh, that you bring forward has been phenomenal. But this one in particular, I, I just see as um, uh, maybe your life's work. I'm, I don't know. I'm sure you have more books inside of you, but it is, uh, it is quite a book. Before we, you know, get into maybe some areas that I really want to make sure we talk about, why don't we start with One Mind? 
-hmm. let's, let's make sure that the audience knows what you are addressing when you talk about the one mind. Well, the one mind for me, Rebecca, is the umbrella that sort of is the overarching uh, principle uh, of all the so-called individual minds that everybody appears to uh, possess. This is not a, a, an original idea. It's certainly not a modern idea. In fact, it's very ancient. Mm -hmm. If you go back uh, three, three and a half millennia, you can find this in Hindu scriptures, you can find it in what are called the Akashic Records, mm -hmm. uh, Christianity, and all the major religions have a, a place for this general notion that uh, all of our individual minds are nourished and subsumed by some overarching dimension of consciousness. And uh, heretofore, this has just been called philosophy. Uh, it's erupted throughout uh, Western history in a continual thread. Uh, you can find uh, this expressed in Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. Uh, William James, the father of American psychology, believed in a one mind. But what I've tried to do in this book, Rebecca, is to take this beyond philosophy and anchor it in, which, in, in something that I think makes all the difference in changing the dialogue. And that's modern science. Uh, the evidence for the one mind comes out of two sources, really. One is people's experiences, which we've had forever. Mm -hmm. uh, these are pejoratively called, in my profession, just anecdotes. They, they aren't given much weight, uh, evidentially. Uh, but we go beyond that now to the other vector of proof for the one mind, and that's actual scientific experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, we now know that there are many threads within science that show that you can't put consciousness in a box. You can't wall it off from all the other individual consciousnesses that are out there, seven billion on the, the planet today, thereabouts. In some dimension, we now know that minds come together. Uh, they don't have boundaries. You can't uh, wall them off from one another. So that's what I mean for a back of other one mind. Well, and in your book, you include animals. Uh, yep. You include every living thing in this. I include all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's arrogant for humans to claim uh, a monopoly in consciousness. Uh, it, it used to be during Cartesian times, uh, three or four hundred years ago, that we made this real, uh, this rigid wall around uh, uh, humans and separated them from all other forms of life. People are increasingly uncomfortable with doing that today. Mm -hmm. And we have experiments today that show that there are no walls that uh, privilege uh, human consciousness, but we have to extend it to all living things. And I think this is one of the real, really important implications and the contributions that this idea of one mind makes to our world today. It opens up consciousness and says it's not our prime uh, original possession. The, this stuff goes around to all sentient creatures, and we have to take uh, uh, cognizance of that fact if we're going to stay alive and thrive on this planet. Yes, yes. I know that non-local reality has been something that you have written about. It's been very important to you. You have really been, let's say, the thought leader author of bringing this forward in big ways when you talked about prayer and healing words. Um, in your best-selling book. And yet, this book, to me, this one mind, really takes this into a whole nother level for you. Um, first of all, just what you weave together in the book is, is amazing, uh, pulling from all kinds of different sources. And it also seems to be personal to you. I, I really got, as I was reading through the book, a, a personal passion, almost like a calling, that, those are going to be my words, a calling, if you will, to to really say it the way that you see it. <laughs> kind of thing. So what would you what would you say to that? Well, I'm, I'm comfortable with that term calling. Uh, I feel uh, definitely that I've been called to speak up for this mm -hmm. idea. Uh, I, I must say, I, <laughs> I was a reluctant responder uh, mm -hmm. to this uh, this idea. Uh, when it became clear to me personally that 
mind function in an infinite, non-local manner, I didn't want to have anything to do with this idea. I mean, the first year in my medical practice, I had some shocking, unnerving personal experiences that clearly showed to me that consciousness was infinite or non-local in space and time. And I realized in a heartbeat that talking about this stuff publicly was really not the best way to advance your career in medicine. So I clammed up about it for quite a while, but the lessons kept coming back. And it became clear to me that this was a vector that I had to speak up about if I was going to live with myself. And so I did. And I coined the term non-local mind in 1989 in a book called Recovering the Soul. I did that with trepidation. Nobody in medicine had ever talked about consciousness in terms of non-locality. But it's now become quite common for people to do that. If you Google non-local mind, you come up with about 5,000 or 6,000 hits showing that this has become a quite common way of speaking about the behavior of consciousness. I'm pretty happy about that. I have a sense of fulfillment that this has been embraced in scientific circles and is becoming an accepted way of talking about our minds in our medical schools today. You know, you speak a lot quite forcefully, I'm going to use that word, about the scientific community and their inability to begin to take these personal experiences that people report and also the scientific evidence out of the anecdotal, you know, category into really taking it seriously. You speak forcefully about this. Is this something that's continuing to sort of rise up inside of you? Well, it certainly is. As you might imagine, I get my share of criticism about going in this direction because most people in my profession and in the neurosciences in general have been practically hypnotized to view the mind as restricted to the brain and the body and to the present moment. If you step outside that paradigm, you get accused of going mystic or succumbing to California woo-woo or something like that. I have a good deal of fun collecting comments that are fairly outrageous from skeptics in my profession who just don't want to have anything to do with this idea. I'll share with you my favorite comment. One skeptic said once in response to this sort of talk, he said, this is the sort of thing I would not believe even if it were true, which gives you the level of opposition that we can sometimes face when we go in this direction, when we violate the dogma that consciousness is produced by the brain and is confined to the brain. So what we're doing, Rebecca, basically in science is committing heresy and blasphemy because most people to this day are woefully uninformed about the database, about the empirical evidence that's pointing in the direction of non-local consciousness and a collective one mind. I think probably it's always been like that to a great degree, not just in medicine and science, but in other areas such as art or music. In almost every area of human endeavor, when really novel new ideas pop up, no matter how legitimate they may be, they're often forcefully rejected by the status quo. I become pretty philosophical about that. It's what I expect. It's what I've experienced. But I know that the body of evidence is on our side. And if I can use a military metaphor, we're going to win this war. It's the good fight, isn't it, Larry? I think it is. And it's also very necessary. It's a fight we haven't chosen, but we'll be foolish and cowardly if we back down these days in this so-called fight because of the very important fact that we have the evidence on our side. Absolutely. And I'm just thinking back through 
uh, you know, our history of beings on the planet. There always have been those collected, those, those few voices that continue to bring forward the greater truth. And eventually, eventually, it shifts. It shifts. Well, we have, yes, it does. And we have to be patient uh, as the process unfolds. I'm one of those people who uh, has a great deal of difficulty being patient. I want it to have happened yesterday. But history usually doesn't uh, unfold like that, at least where these revolutionary ideas are concerned in medicine and science. Uh, medicine and science tend to be very conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a, a while for the evidence to build, but as we know from descriptions about how these things operate in the field of science, when the shift happens, it often happens very suddenly. It just takes a long time to build up to the tipping point. Right, exactly. I agree. And I'm with you. I am one of those impatient ones, but we will support <laughs> each other to be patient. <laughs> yes, we'll do that. <laughs> well, let's Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the One Mind. Could you share, there's so many wonderful stories in your book. Uh, could you share maybe one of your personal favorites of uh, illustrating uh, these, this One Mind? Well, I'll just remind the viewers that the basic premise of the One Mind is that there are no boundaries between them. Uh, you can't wall them off from all the other minds. They come together uh, in this collective One Mind uh, scenario. Uh, one of my favorite areas of the book uh, is due to the fact that I'm an identical twin, and uh, my twin brother and I have shared these kinds of non-local, distant experiences all of our life. Uh, there is a, a section of the book that's called Telesomatic Events, and telesomatic comes from a Latin term meaning the distant body, and it's, it, it's as if two distant people share the same body because they can simultaneously experience thoughts and emotions and even physical symptoms even though they may be miles and miles apart. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how far apart they are, they can be on the other side of the earth from one another. So uh, in this uh, particular uh, section where I deal with these distant telesomatic events and identical twins, the uh, story that I picked to emphasize occurred in the 1970s in northern Spain, and it involved two identical twin girls who were four years old. Uh, their names were Sylvia and Marta Landa. And what happened is that one day, the father took one of the girls off to see the grandparents, who were miles and miles away, and uh, the other little twin girl stayed home to help mom do chores. Well, unfortunately, while she was helping her mother, she touched her hand to a red-hot iron. And she erupted in a particular area on her palm with a huge set of blister, a second-degree burn. And at the same time, her daughter, her sister, her twin sister, miles and miles away, erupted with the same pattern of a blister on the same hand mm. in the same area. Mm. Now, this looks like witchcraft or voodoo or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stunning connectivity that we often see in people who are emotionally close. Uh -huh. now, I want to identify this factor of emotional closeness because this is one of the threads that runs through these ways in which the one mind can operate between individuals as if they have a common mind. You know, you don't see these kinds of uh, distant telesomatic events in all twins. Uh, some twins don't enjoy emotional closeness. They're very competitive because they have a difficult time uh, forming their own sense of individuality. So they don't want to they don't want to be alike or connected. But in identical twins, where you find this emotional integration, these uh, these experiences are very common. They also occur, as I talk about in the book. Uh, between other people who are emotionally close. The primordial example is probably a mother and her infant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people who are in love. Lovers often experience these distant connections. Uh, and so do other people who are emotionally close as well. Uh, I like these examples because they do emphasize that this is a, uh, a, a kind of experience that is leavened with human emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and love as, is, as any self-respecting poet uh, probably uh, would acknowledge, love is something that can bridge a gap 
it can unite people even when they're distant in space and time. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the favorite uh, stories uh, in the book for me. Yes, I I particularly like that part of the book as well. And I, I could, and one other thing. Yeah. Uh, my, my, I'm married to uh, a, a twin. My wife Barbara and her fraternal uh, twin brother have had these sorts of distant experiences also uh, throughout their life. Mm -hmm. So a our household has been sort of a twin laboratory <laughs> uh, <laughs> over the years where, where some very weird things uh, have taken place. <laughs> <laughs> Spooky things in a distance, or whatever the uh, quote the quote was from Einstein. That's right. You know, you talk about emotional connection, emotional closeness. You talk about one mind. I really want to kind of get into why all this matters. Um, it, first of all, the book. I just want to say that if I want to recommend that people read the book. It is certainly, uh, if I can read it, anybody can read it, in other words, even though, you know, Larry is a medical doctor and he does cite a lot of scientific uh, studies and things like that. It is very readable and it is chock full of all of the evidence in all different kinds of ways. But the why it matters to me is, is for me, what is so important about this. Um, you know, one of the questions that was brought forward was, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we have a one mind? Why does it matter that I even know that? Why would it matter to me? Could you uh, address that, please? For a long time, Rebecca, I've been concerned about uh, our state of environmental uh, degradation. It, it's not clear to me that we are going to be able to survive as a species in any way that would be very meaningful uh, to us. I think that we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, this alarm is not uh, unique to me. Uh, it's been raised by people who have written beautifully about problems of environmental degradation, uh, the pollution that's rampant on the earth, the acidification of our oceans, exploding populations, chronic war, religious hatreds, uh, and so on. I uh, probably don't have to tick those off for people who are watching this, uh, this particular program. But we're in trouble as a species. And for the first time in human history, we can really see an end. Uh, it is not clear that we will be around uh, infinitely mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, planet. And I think that uh, this rec recognition has reached uh, fever pitch. And I think that our way out of this it's not probably going to be through political uh, innovations, probably not even engineering solutions, uh, but a reformation in the way we think about who we are and what our uh, options are as a species. Uh, I believe that our best hope, maybe our only hope, to uh, uh, achieve longevity on this planet is to conceive our relationships with other people and with all other sentient life. Uh, I think one way of approaching this is through this premise of the one mind. Uh, Alice Walker, the great novelist, uh, said once that uh, anything we love can be saved. Uh, we're in the business of trying to save our own uh, skins on this earth. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, how much do we love one another? How much do we love all sentient life. How much do we love the environment? Now, I think one way of approaching this is to recognize our connectivity and our unity with all of life on Earth. Now, this can be done through the recognitions that we're one with it. We're united. We couldn't secede from nature even if we tried. Mm -hmm. And so the one mind is a portal of recognition uh, for this kind of connectivity and unity. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that one person or a group of people can affect the, you know, consciousness of the one mind, increase it, let's say, or bring it more fully forward or affect that in some way? I think there's no question about it. And that's one of the great contributions that the premise of one mind makes to human welfare, in my opinion. Uh, it, uh, it destroys the sense of isolation. 
and helplessness that so many people feel today when they encounter planetary uh, problems. Mm -hmm. well, what can I do as an individual? Well, the recognition must be that you're not just an individual. You're part of something grander than you ever imagined. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the Prince of the One Mind offers us the possibility of tapping into a pool of wisdom and power and information that uh, is absolutely awesome. And in the book I go into uh, uh, examples of how this actually happens and gets worked out in the lives of uh, creative people. Yes. One example I mentioned is Thomas Edison, the great American inventor, uh, who said once, uh, people say I've created things. He said, I've never created anything. And this is a shocking revelation from somebody we consider our greatest American inventor. Uh, he went on to say that thoughts are things that come from the outside. He said, I'm just a recording apparatus on a record uh, or a plate, what you will. And so this is a powerful insight from somebody who knew a thing or two about creativity. This is the opportunity that membership and citizenship in the one mind makes available to everyone. We don't have to do it all by ourselves. In one sense, this feeling of isolation and helplessness is a hallucination. Mm -hmm. It's not the real, it's not a reality. It's not a reality because we're not just isolated. We're more than individual minds. And if we're going to survive and thrive on this planet, I think that we're going to have to uh, take advantage of this recognition, and it's urgent. I have a strong feeling of urgency about this. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that time is on our side. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need to get on with things because uh, of the urgency of the problems that uh, are legion that yeah. we face. Yeah. Yeah, well, I got that in the book, too, a sense of urgency, and quite honestly, I loved it. Uh, because I think we are in the the eleventh hour or the twelfth hour or minutes before whatever you want to call it. Right. Let's talk about accessing the one mind because perhaps someone in the audience is listening to you going, "Well, is it? You know, how do I do this? Is this hard? What would you like to say about that?" This is not hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I know that, it's but all, go ahead. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it's so easy; it's almost comical. You have to try uh, <laughs> to uh, avoid this in order to, to not see it. I, uh, I I truly mean this. I think that most of us have been sort of bamboozled and hypnotized to think that uh, it's the other way around. Right. Uh, everything in our culture emphasizes the cult of the individual, and so we grow up with this idea that uh, uh, we're isolated. Uh, Reality has a way of just hammering on the door and saying, it's the other way around. Wake up. Mm -hmm. You know, look around. Experience uh, the oneness. Uh, if you go into any bookstore today, it would be hard to avoid books which teach you how to do it. Uh, I think it's not how you do it. It's how you be it mm -hmm. and how you let it inform you. You know, simple surveys show that uh, upwards of 75 to 80 percent of the American population regularly experiences something weird that in some circles is called telepathy or clairvoyance, uh, precognition, and so on. That's where I had my comeuppance as a first-year internal medicine physician uh, with a series of precognitive dreams mm -hmm. uh, saying, look, this is the way you've been taught is not the way all this works. I mean, there's another point of view. You're not isolated. You're connected. And my connectivity uh, came through uh, precognitive dreams. But there are other ways. You don't have to really do anything. Sometimes it does you. Uh, for example, a lot of people describe having awakenings, what we sometimes call epiphanies, mm -hmm. that just happen. It, it's like getting zapped. I mean, you didn't know it, now you know it. Mm -hmm. This is a sudden thing. Uh, people experience these things when they're actually doing nothing, just sitting around, uh, wasting time, washing dishes. Uh, one of my friends had an epiphany of being connected with all there is when he said he was sitting on the edge of his bed one morning, picking lint from his navel. <laughs> so, 
I, I don't want to be silly about this, but my point is that these uh, experiences that connect us with the one mind, uh, connect us with all there is, with other sentient life, really are fairly mundane. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, hammer at us uh, in just a, a million ways. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 million Americans now are estimated to have had near-death experiences. Now, this is one of the most dramatic ways of entering into this uh, sense of oneness and connectedness with all there is. Now, I don't recommend this because this can be lethal, but people who survive resuscitation in modern hospitals often come back with these stories, as you know, and uh, forever after, their life uh, is changed. It's utterly transformed, and after having passed through the eye of that needle, there's just no going back for these people. Right. So there are just a million ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's a mistake to try too hard to manipulate or, or, or to manipulate this understanding or awareness and really struggle to have an experience like this. I think we can't manipulate this awareness. We can set the stage for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we can invite it. And we do that by engaging in certain behaviors that open up the unconscious uh, in ways that reveal a wisdom that was suppressed during our waking hours. Meditation, contemplation, prayer, listening to, to, to great music or viewing great art. There's just a million things, a million ways in which we can set the stage for the eruption of this awareness in our life. Yes, it is an, an ordinary experience. It is part of who we are as divine human beings. So I love that you bring that forward. The other maybe sticking point uh, that we could just address, and I love the way that you talk about it in the book, is this thing about if someone's listening to this going, well, what about me? You know, I'm an individual. Am I going to lose that if I go into this one mind? Am, am I going to stop being me? What would you say to that? I say, don't sweat it. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear this all the time. You, you know, this comes out of this cultural emphasis uh, on individuality and uh, personality and self and ego. Uh, we, we're hardwired biologically to emphasize our individuality. And there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, the fact is, in general, that... Uh, that creatures who don't value individuality just don't survive long uh, as a species uh, on this particular planet. Uh, individuality is important, and we're not minimizing that. Uh, I, actually, I stand up for that. I'm just saying that there's another side of the coin. Uh, individuality is not all good. Uh, I think it has led to an epidemic of greed and selfishness and destruction uh, uh, worldwide uh, these days. Uh, it's one of the real reasons why we're in the trouble that we're in as a species on this planet. Uh, individuality is in what I call a complementary relationship with their collective uh, relations, relationships with one another and all conscious life. Uh, complementarity is a, a term that's come out of uh, modern physics and it means that in order to fully describe something, it's okay to bring in descriptions that are opposite each other. Mm. You have to have these mutually opposite uh, descriptions in order to give a full description of what something is. That's the relationship between individuality and collectivity. Mm. Uh, so we need both. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we are both. Our experiences tell us that this is uh, the nature of uh, who we are. You know, transpersonal psychology has made a great contribution along these lines in recent years. Uh, there's an old saying in transpersonal psychology that before you transcend the ego, first of all, you have to have one. Mm -hmm. yes. And before you go beyond the sense of self, you first have to have a self. So even the transcendent uh, view of uh, spiritual growth uh, relies upon the necessity of being an individual of experiencing an ego and a self. But where we go wrong is where we say, this is all we are. Mm -hmm. We're just that ego. We're just that self. We're just an individual. This is what's gotten us into a tremendous uh, bunch of trouble uh, on this particular planet uh, at this period in our history. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's been going on for some time, hasn't it? 
Yep, it is. Do you think we are ready? Do you think that we, and I'm talking about the collective we, are really ready to embrace this, what you, what you call one mind, I would call it something else, but that's okay. We, uh, yeah. we know what we're talking about here. Do you think we're ready? I think a great number of people are ready. Uh, it's easy to underestimate them because they tend not to be very vocal. Mm -hmm. Because, let's face it, there's still a social stigma in certain areas of society about going public mm -hmm. with this kind of uh, talk and with this kind of awareness. There's a growing recognition that we're in crisis, and this may be one of the, uh, the best hopes we have of uh, going through it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we are ready. But let me, let me add this. In many circles, there's this idea that there has to be this global transformation before we're going to escape from the challenges that we face. Uh, human culture has never operated like that. We don't have to even, uh, I think, convert a, a majority of people over to this one mind point of view. Uh, for example, if you go back to what happened during uh, the Renaissance in Italy, mm -hmm. it's often thought that, boy, you know, most of the Italian population must have come around and that's what spawned the Renaissance. It was never like that. It was an extreme minority of very influential people who came around to a new way of thinking about reality and art and so on. And so we don't have to convert everybody, probably not even a majority, but it's a few key people uh, who are influential and are willing to stand up and go forward uh, who will make all of the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I find this uh, comforting because it sort of uh, takes the pressure off and says, you know, the job is not quite as, as daunting as we might have thought. Right. So yes, I think people are ready. Mm -hmm. I think there are an increasing number of people who yearn mm -hmm. for this transformation to happen and they're willing to do just about anything in their private life to make it so. Mm -hmm. And do you um, do you believe that it really is, it starts with the individual, so it's like how I live my life, uh, how I bring my compassion, my kindness, uh, my uh, inclusivity forward, how I live my life in alignment with uh, the good of all, um, you know, the planet including, um, and live in alignment with all of that is that's something that you believe is a good place to start? Oh, I definitely believe that. Uh, that's a beautiful expression, and it's a great way to put it, uh, by the way. You know, this idea that uh, consciousness is not local, that it's uh, a collective phenomenon, sort of takes the pressure off and reduces the sense of responsibility. You see, this idea of individuality can get in our way here. Uh, we're never just individual. We're part of a tremendous collectivity of power, of creativity, uh, and awareness that uh, is infinite in space and time. So uh, I'm always taken back to a comment Margaret Mead made. She was asked once, can uh, individuals change the world? Can a, and she answered, uh, a small group of committed individuals can change the world. She said, Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Yes. Uh, so we need to be optimistic about this. Mm -hmm. Pessimism is our, em our enemy here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it can hamper our, our best efforts. Uh, I think that uh, the role of love and compassion and kindness, which you brought up, uh, is also hugely uh, pivotal here. Mm -hmm. You know. The golden rule says, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's rooted in a sense of individuality and isolation, a sense of self and non-self. And I think that on the basis of evidence now, we ought to upgrade and recalibrate the golden rule to something like this. Be kind to others because in some sense they are you. <laughs> And this emphasizes this global connectivity mm -hmm. and oneness, uh, mm -hmm. which I uh, call the one mind. Yes, beautifully. I, I, I really love that. That's wonderful. Well, we have been talking with Larry Dossie. Again, this is his 
brand new book, One Mind, How Our Individual Mind is Part of a Greater Consciousness and Why It Matters. So just maybe one last question here, Larry, and uh, whatever you want to, if I haven't covered something that you'd really love to talk about, please feel free. Uh Um, How has the study, the experience, the delving so deeply into this whole area of one mind, how has it impacted you personally? Well, when I first stumbled onto this uh, awareness, uh, uh, I was unnerved <laughs> <laughs> and uh, rather shaken up by the whole deal. I, you know, I didn't want to go there. Uh, since then, I, I, I have come around to a just a completely different uh, attitude. Uh, it has added enormously to my uh, sense of peace and tranquility uh, in my life. You know, I began to recognize some of the implications of this uh, non-local form of consciousness early on. Uh, Part of it has to do with their view of death. Mm. Uh, You see, if consciousness is non-local in space and time, then it's infinite Mm -hmm. in time. Therefore, there's some aspect of who we are that's immortal. Uh, That just comes with the territory. It's not something we have to acquire or develop. Uh, That's just who we are. It's factory installed. Uh, so as a physician, this has been very important to me. I, I happen to believe that the fear of death and annihilation of everything that we are with physical death has caused more suffering for uh, more humans in the history of the human race than all the physical diseases combined. Uh, the one mind, the non-locality of consciousness, uh, is a way out of that. It's the great cure for this this great disease, this fear of death that has haunted humanity. I think this is one of the greatest contributions that this uh, concept of the one mind makes to human welfare. Mm. So that's certainly been an avenue of comfort and peace uh, for me as I've uh, come to terms with this idea over the years. Yes. Yes, I definitely agree uh, to that. You know, what... What I uh, get in touch with when you're talking about is fear, you know, just how how fear runs our life in so many ways. And the fear of death is one of the biggest ways in which we limit ourselves and who we are. I know in the work that I do, um, I'm constantly working with people to let go of their limits around fear so that they can expand into what you call the one mind. Um, the greater reality of who we are. And then when we do that, we really do access greater levels of peace and well-being and balance and clarity and happiness, you know? It kind of takes the pressure off. Uh, <laughs> I, I used to counsel my patients uh, who had uh, horrible diseases, even diseases that we both knew were going to be fatal. I, I used to lovingly assure them, well, you know... Uh, if this disease uh, increases and you die, you're just, you're just going to have to settle for immortality. <laughs> and it usually brought a uh, you know a smile to their face and a knowing that uh, there's mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. to who we are than mm-hmm. what happens to the physical body. Mm-hmm. Well, this has just been delightful for me. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing? Well, I think that. Uh, the message is that there is more to us than we've been taught. We can't put our minds uh, in a box. Like it or not, we're all connected. <laughs> and we need to make the best uh, out of that. And uh, out of that comes a sense of uh, love and compassion. And it's one of the things that makes life worthwhile. Mm-hmm. You know, if we really want a sense of fulfillment and expansion in our life, we need to get in touch with the larger dimensions of who we are. I think the one mind is a portal, a doorway, through which we can walk that makes that possible. Mm. Yes. Applause, applause, applause. <laughs> You're so kind, Rebecca. <laughs> well, well, thank I mean, you. I, I realize I'm preaching to the choir here, but what? as someone told me once, considering the state of choirs these days, they need preaching too. So, uh, <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, we can't say this stuff. Uh, enough. Uh, I really do believe, like I said at the beginning of uh, this interview, that we are speaking this new world into reality. So the more 
that we use our words to send out these vibrations. Uh, this would be the way I talk about it. The better. Sure. <laughs> the better. So, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'm with you 100% in the one mind. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, Dr. Larry Dossey, thank you so much for your time today. I know you are right at the beginning of this book launch. You have many invitations for interviews. So thank you so much for spending time with Wisdom School TV. It's been special. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. So that concludes our interview today with Larry Dossey. And once again, One Mind, how our individual mind is part of a greater consciousness and why it matters. So until next time, bye-bye from Wisdom School TV.